And that brings us to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. So topic A, uh, David, is what we were just talking about, the shutdown. Uh, the two, the government uh, remains, a big chunk of the government remains closed. The Democrats in the White House don't seem to agree. What are we, I mean, here we are, what are we now, two weeks into this, uh, what are we? What are we learning about uh, these uh, our leaders? <laughs> well, I've talked myself into deranged but minimal optimism. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, think there's a, a substantively. I think there's a solution here, and people in the Senate are talking about it, which is uh, that they exchange some money for a wall of some sort in exchange for a path to citizenship for the Dreamers, for the DACA uh, kids, and that's something that as was talked about last year. Uh, at much higher rates, of $25 billion for the wall, not $5 billion. Yeah. And th there was a lot of momentum for it then. And so I think, substantively, that would be a good deal. Uh, Donald Trump won an election on the wall. He can get some money for a wall. Democrats feel strongly about the Dreamers. They can make progress on the Dreamers. It seems like that's a deal by uh, including, including a lot more immigration packages as part of it. The problem is the theater of it, uh, that nobody wants to be seen to be giving in. Both sides kind of enjoy standing up to the others. So getting past the optics and getting to the substance is, turns out to be a major challenge. So, Mark, are we closer to a solution than, than, it, than it looks like we are? Uh, I'm not sure, Judy, but I, I will say that uh, the, the closing of the sizable faction of the United States government is being felt by real people. I mean, there are no clinical trials at uh, National Institute of Health where sick children are being admitted. Uh, uh, the FBI, which is involved in the safety of the country, the TSA, uh, the, the air traffic control, I mean, are all depleted. And we're seeing people being forced to go into jobs in the private sector or uh, to leave their posts. I mean, their public services, the country's less safe, uh, whether it's in, in uh, checking uh, food safety, whatever, um, and government does matter. It touches people's lives, and there will be a human tragedy. There'll be a, there'll be a human tragedy, and it'll be directly traceable uh, to this uh, this slowdown, shutdown uh, of the of the federal government. Just on a on a political note, it's paralyzed the immigration courts. Uh, so uh, you have undocumented immigrants who are scheduled to be deported. Uh, now that's no longer the case. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what will happen? I, I, I think David has proposed what is a sensible, rational uh, alternative and compromise. Um, it, it's been considered, but I'll be very frank. Uh, dealing with Donald Trump right now is is not seen as a, as a, a starter. I mean, he's a man who broke his word uh, on the on the closing of the government. Uh, he was a, a agreed to. Uh, deferring this issue until February 6th, and just criticism from Michelle Monk and Ann Coulter and Rush Limbaugh, and he uh, caved like a $2 suitcase. So, so, David, if Mark is saying it's the president who's the problem, I mean, it is one side or another bear most of the responsibility here? Well, there's plenty of blame to go around. I don't see why Nancy Pelosi says there can't be any money for a wall. I mean, we've got 30 percent of the budget of the border right now, the, our southern border, has some sort of fencing. If that goes up to 40, that doesn't seem like a moral issue to me. I don't think the wall is a particularly wise investment. Uh, the, and it's really not where illegal immigration comes from. It's not where drugs come from. It comes from people overstaying their, their visas. But it's what Donald Trump wants. He runs on it. Giving him a little of what he wants doesn't seem to me like a moral issue. And building a little more fencing on the southern border doesn't seem to be a big moral crime. So I don't see why the Democrats are so uh, rigid on that. I do think they have to make a call, can we deal with this guy about anything? If they decide Donald Trump is just not a functional player, then we're, we're in for a world of hurt. They may decide that, and they may be right about that. But I think the Schumer, Pelosi, and Trump have to feel each other out, and the, which they're doing now, and saying, is this a man we can do business with, or is he not? And that, that's a kind of just a character judgment they have to make, and will have big implications for the next two years. I, I, I just, uh, just one point of dissent. I mean, Nancy Pelosi is a grown-up. I mean, Nancy Pelosi came to office as Speaker of the House um, and was faced with a Republican president, George W. Bush, with whom she had disagreed on the war, and she provided the votes 
to keep the country's economy from absolutely going off the cuff. I mean, she's absolutely submerged. The Republicans couldn't do it. John Boehner had tried mightily, uh, and he failed, and Nancy Pelosi did it. Nancy Pelosi saved the automobile industry in this country and saved Wall Street after the crisis. So, I mean, she's done this. I mean, Donald Trump has the toughest thing he's ever done was to ask Republicans to vote for a tax cut. The people who've given you the most money to your campaign, I want to give them a tax cut. Will you vote for it? Well, I will. You know, that's because that's what we stand for. We really stand for tax cuts. And so, you know, I, I, I just think we're talking with one person who's a professional who stood up in the last campaign, supported members in her own party, remember this, who refused to support her for speaker. And she backed them and enthusiastically and wanted them to win. Donald Trump, the slightest criticism, and he goes after uh, Mark Sanford uh, and, and, and beats him and strikes terror and tremor through the entire Republican ranks to this day when Mitch McConnell is paralyzed to do anything. Well, what about, just quickly, David's point that because Trump ran on this, it was a central plank of his campaign, why can't, I mean, for the sake of argument, why can't the Democrats just say, okay, we're going to give you some of what you're asking for in order to... They, they, they did, yeah. Judy, and he, and he reneged on it. Right. I mean, and they've, they've gone to 2.6. I, I don't know. I mean, is, if you had a deal with them, would you have it in writing? Would you get it from Mitch McConnell on DACA, as David suggests? Yeah. Would, you know, Kevin McCarthy uh, does, shows no... He's, he's an invertebrate. He's criticizing the new congresswoman from Michigan, uh, whose profanity you alluded to earlier. He was mute when Donald Trump attacked the, uh, the Khan family. He was mute when Donald Trump suggested Barack Obama was born in the country. The, the, the Democrats have to make a decision. This, either the only this guy is we can't deal with this guy and the only route is impeachment, or maybe we can deal with this guy, and they have to make that call. I. I personally think it's tr work, trying to work out a deal is the right I, thing to do, given that we're in a government shutdown and this can't last forever. I, I, am, I am not, I'm, I'm not for not working with him. You have to have it in writing. You have to have him in public. I mean, because we saw what he did, David. Because he, he backed down the last. He backed the down last. completely. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's talk about the new Congress. Um, David Mark mentioned Nancy Pelosi. She's the leader of the Democrats. We've got a new reality in Washington. How different is it going to be? Uh, do you, what is there a message you feel coming clearly from the Democrats now? Well, I, I mean, it, it's, it's a net, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, the, con the Congress should look like the country. It's called the House of Representatives. It should be representative. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that the, the House looks marginally more like the country is a good thing. You got people from different perspectives, from different points of view, and people can look at the U.S. Congress and say, yeah, that sort of looks a little more like me. And so that, that by itself is a good thing. I also think we're going to get to see, as frankly, and this may be a gendered comment, we're going to get to see a lot more attention paid to certain issues, which I think are the core issues uh, of American life. I've spent a lot of time over the course of my career trying to get senators to talk about, and members of the House, to talk about early childhood education, which I think is a major issue for this country. And I would always get a pat on the head by a lot of, frankly, the older males and because the real issues are about defense and banking and taxes. Those are what real men deal with. Dealing with little things like childhood education, that's like a second-rate issue. And now I'm hoping as we get a more representative Congress, there'll be a little more attention paid to issues that are relational, that are about the social fabric of this country. So I'm being hopeful about that. Now, will things change, Mark? Uh, they will. Uh, I think David makes a good point. It's point out in 1989, Judy, there were 29 women in the House of Representatives, 16 Democrats, 13 Republicans who are women. Uh, today, there are 102. There's still 13 Republican women. There's 89 Democratic women. I mean, the, De the Republican Party is a lost is a hemorrhage of, 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 of defecting groups. Um, it's women. Um, the, Repu the more Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 on a percentage basis than did Democrats. And uh, it, yet today, the Republican Party is absent any, there's one woman of color in the entire Republican Congress. Um, it's, a, it's a party that is all white, increasingly male. Uh, it's a party uh, that is not welcoming to immigrants or immigrants' families. Um, and and, and that's, a, that's a real problem for our country and for our two-party system. Uh, you, you know, I mean, the Democrats are, are guilty of and, and have yielded too, too often to identity politics and trumping, uh, their, de trumpeting their differences. But, I mean, the, the point is, if, if you're talking about a, the face of America and the reality of America, one party does represent it and the other party doesn't. 
and, and Nancy Pelosi, who you both have, have referred to here, uh, is dealing with a Democratic caucus, David, in the House that they supported her. She got all but, what, 15 votes. That's 15 right. 15 Democrats voted for her. But there are some of them who are in a hurry, who want things to happen very, they want them to happen now. Um, how is she going to do dealing with that? Well, as Mark said, she's, if anybody's qualified to do this, she's, she's qualified to do this. She does bang heads together. But it is a party that, as Mark says, it's a more diverse party. On the other hand, it's doing an extremely good job of driving away a lot of people, which is why the Demo Republican Party is still a viable party. And if there are a lot of Democrats who say, you know, we're going to raise tax rates to 70 percent, that's a problem for a lot of moderate voters. Uh, and so it... It, it'll be very interesting to see whether she can exercise any message discipline about the party. She's already facing that challenge right away about impeachment. But the, there are, the seri more serious issues are the, some of the policies. And a lot of her people who call themselves socialists, and they are socialists, if they go down that road, that'll have some destabilizing effect on the party as centrists say, well, didn't like Trump, but not sure I voted, I want a 70% federal tax rate. Yeah. So. Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi is, is handful, dealing handful. dealing with yeah, yeah. A, a handful, of, a, not hands, full, a handful. hands full of a hands full members of who want things to happen and, quickly. And, and members who've been celebrated by the right. press and had access to you know, cable television and are now celebrities in their own right um, who aren't the I mean, the usual deferential right. role of f freshmen historically and kind of coming and waiting months before they make a speech. Uh, I, I agree with David that Nancy is the one person who could do this. Um, Jim Wright, former Democratic Speaker of the House, said of the Democratic Party then, uh, and I think it's true today, Democratic Party is a mosaic, it's an amalgam, let's call it a fruitcake. <laughs> um, and, you know, the Republicans have the strength yeah. of homogeneity and they have the weakness of homogeneity. Uh, but there's, there's no question, this is going to be a, a shakedown cruise for Democrats. So quickly, Republicans, big change among, in that the Democrats took over the House, David, but this is a new time for Republicans as well. They picked up a couple of seats in the Senate, but there are now some Republicans who are going to be speaking up against President Trump. We saw the commentary from Mitt Romney. Uh, there are a few, a few of them are saying they don't like what the president's doing on the shutdown. How much opposition may he confront from within his own party? My view, it'll, it'll be strong until it's not. That is to say, all, all leaders, most leaders have a well of admiration and affection to draw upon when times get tough. Donald Trump, even among Republicans, or at least among elite Republicans, does not have that. And so once it goes, I think it would go all at once. So Mitt Romney does not, is not there are not going to be a lot of Mitt Romneys out there right now. But the way the RNC reacted, which is to try to tie down the primary process and make it very hard to challenge Trump in the primary, that reflected real anxiety. Because if there's another conservative alternative and 2019 turns into an ugly as a year as I think it's going to be, then his hold on power is a little fractious just because he has no personal attachments to anybody. 20 seconds. Well, let's apologize to Mitt Romney for everything that was said about him when he said Russia was the United States' greatest geopolitical force. He was right about it he in 2012. Uh, and everybody, snidely, uh, including papers and, and press and politicians, uh, derided him. Uh, I, I'd say that Mitt Romney is not Jeff Flake. He's not Bob Corker. He's going to be here after Donald Trump has ever been on a ballot again. And uh, what this, he's done this week is give a legitimacy to pollsters, putting him in to polls against Democratic candidates in 2020. And if he runs consistently better than Donald Trump does against hypothetical Democratic nominees, that is trouble for Donald Trump. Watch this space. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you.